Welcome to Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. My name is Katie Campbell Shumway. And I'm Katherine Summerlin with the Houston League of Women Voters. On this broadcast, we have Dr. Audrey Young from the State Board of Education from District 8. We're going to ask a few questions, learn about her background, and her positions on issues affecting District 8 and our Texas education system. I'd like to welcome all welcome you to Conversations with the Candidates with the League of Women Voters of Houston. Thank you for being here, Dr. Young. Thank you for having me. So we'll first just start off by um, introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first I'd like to tell you thank you for the opportunity. Um, I highly respect the work of the League of, of Women Voters, so thank you for having me here this evening. Um, I am Dr. Audrey Young, and this is my 29th year in public education. I'm the Director of Student Support Services for Nacogdoches ISD, and so public education is what I do all day, every day. Um, I oversee all special education services, dyslexia, behavior, um, all of the testing, all the therapies at Nacogdoches, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, my husband is Reverend Scott Moore, and he's the pastor at Wesley Memorial United Methodist Church in Huntsville. He's also a deputy sheriff for Trinity um, County Sheriff's Department. Uh, I have two daughters, Amanda, and she is the director of a medical clinic in Huntsville. And my other daughter is Amy Beth, and she is the charge nurse on the neurology floor at Cook's Children's in Fort Worth. Um, I'm very proud of them. They're both college graduates and, um, and work full time in their field. And I don't have to pay their car insurance or their cell phone bill anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Young, why is the State Board of Education uh, seat important to you and what made you decide to seek the seat in the uh, SBOE? I decided to seek the seat um, for State Board of Education several years ago. I, when I was finishing my doctorate, uh, which I earned at Stephen F. Austin State University, I had the opportunity to do a political education um, internship with Representative Trent Ashby. And during that internship, uh, Dr. Kevin Ellis, who's now the chair of the State Board of Education, was running for his first term at State Board. And at the, the end, at the culmination of my internship, in which I really learned a lot about politics, and at the time, Trent Ashby was um, on the House Pub Ed Committee, um, I had the opportunity to learn a lot about the politics of education. I was serving on my local school board, uh, Apple Springs ISD. It's a little baby school district. It's 1A, 215 students, pre-K through 12. Um, we have three buses <laughs> and we play six man football. Um, and I had served um, I had served on the board a total of six years when I was elected to the State Board of Education. But at that time, um, he said, he said, what ultimately do you want to do? And I said, well, I think one day I'd like to run for state board because I serve on my local board. I'm in public education. What better way to like be get to the pinnacle of educational politics, essentially, <clears throat> in that lane? And so he said, well, you need to meet my friend, Dr. Kevin Ellis. And I said, I'd be more than happy to. He said, because he's running in his first campaign for state board. And so that's how I got interested. I contacted the state board member who is currently in the seat. Um, and her name is Barbara Cargill. She was phenomenal in her seat. Uh, 16 years she served, oh. which is just incredible. Yeah. That's a really long time to serve. And she she is a little tiny woman, but very powerful. And I always say, you know, she's a tiny woman, but I still have really big shoes to fill. So I contacted Barbara and I told her about my interest in it. And she was encouraging and helpful and um, said, go for it, Audrey. You know, you might as well. 
and um, and I sent her my resume and um, and just to just to like get some ideas from her and anyway we, it just went from there uh, and so she retired from the board I had told her I'd never run against her uh, but she was retiring from the board and um, I and I knew that her seat was coming open and so I threw my hat in the ring and uh, I was elected uh, in 2020. Great. So some people may not know, but there are 15 members of the State Board of Education, and each of these districts has nearly 2 million residents. So since you're running for re-election, how have you handled such a large district, and do you have any um, changes that you will um, plan to do if you are elected um, for this next one? So to answer your first part of the question, yes, it's a huge district, right? Um, there are 15 members of the board. I would not want District 1, which is, that's like 130 counties. It's like all of West mm -hmm. Texas, which is giant. Um, and so, yes, <laughs> yes, you have it here. <laughs> yes, it's huge. Um, my district, the district that I'm currently in, District 8, was originally nine counties with redistricting with the census. It is now, uh, it, it moves into 11 counties, uh, so it was expanded. We went from representing 1.7 million constituents to 1.9 plus million constituents. It is, it is very, very large. I'm hugely fortunate because I work in public education and because I served on my school board. So I'm really familiar with a number of the board members in, in, in every school district in my SBOE district, mm -hmm. as well as the majority of the superintendents. Uh, because I have been a district administrator for so long, I have seen them and presented uh, alongside them, as well as to them, at many um, major state conventions um, for decades now. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of them know me, and I know them, and we know how each other functions and so it was easy to reach out to all of the superintendents it's been easy to reach out to different board members um, it's it's very nice when I'm invited to something um, I recently just was invited to the opening of a brand new high school in Waller ISD which is one of my new counties um, in this redistricting and so uh, it was it's just uh, amazing I know right mm -hmm. so I have Trinity County Walker County Houston County Polk County San Jacinto, Grimes, parts of Harris, parts of Montgomery, parts of Fort Bend, Waller, um, and parts of Galveston. Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's 11, right? I think I made it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's not easy to get around to everyone, but I do get invited to things like this. Mm -hmm. So um, I get you know the opportunity to, to share my, the, my thought process. I'm, I'm highly communicative, so I, I try to answer almost every single email that comes to me. That's um, and, and, and recently, uh, we received a barrage of like 4,000 emails on a particular subject uh, that we were covering at State Board, and I answered probably the better part of 3,900 of them. Wow. Um, and so um, recently, people said, you were the only person who answered my email. Mm -hmm. I think it's huge. I think it's important. If you're going to reach out to me, um, I think it's important that I respond in one way or another. And if that is, let me look at it and get it back to you, or let me send you on to somebody else who actually can help you with that, then that's what I'll, what I do. Well, that's great. Communication is absolutely critical. So dovetailing a little bit, one of the responsibilities of the SBOE is oversight of the 56 billion permanent school fund. In 2019, the Houston Chronicle reported problems with the fund and the legislature approved creation of a new management system. What will you do as an SBOE member to safeguard this school fund? Well, thank you for asking that. Um, and we, there are three different committees for state board. So I'm, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with that, but I'll share that with you. Um, there's one for the public school fund, and that's five of the board members. Then there's uh, five board members for um, cur curriculum and instruction, committee on instruction. And then there's uh, five board members on school initiatives. And each of us are charged within those committees, uh, certain lanes of the SBOE, right? Certain factions of what we cover. And so we rely heavily on those and those other committees. I'm the vice chair of the, the committee on curriculum. And so um, I am not in on public funds, although I'm responsible for keeping track of it. However, I rely highly on um, the, the people in that um, committee 
to tell me what it is that I need to know about this and, and um, what they have discovered and what choices that they have made because then they come back to the full board and let us know how it's going. Managing the funds is hugely important. Um, it was shared between land, the Land Commission and the, the State Board of Education. I believe now the State Board of Education has the major majority of, um, of management of those funds. Um, like anything, you know, it's, it's not as simple as just managing your checkbook. Uh, it would probably be really nice and I'd want to be on that committee if that was the case. <laughs> um, however, um, they make huge investments all over the United States and, um, and they just keep getting, gaining those funds are gaining. Um, we're making progress um, and we can afford education in the state of Texas, which is very important. So I would say that the State Board of Education is doing a great job of conservative, conservative leadership um, in their finances. Great. Well, actually, my question is perfect then because um, it's all about curriculum. Yay! So um, as I assume you will agree, it's one of the um, one of the most important responsibilities for SBOE members is the approval of public school curriculum. Um, we have on here that in 2010, the SBOE received a lot of controversy and scrutiny over its hearings on science and technology and social studies revisions. This summer, which I, because you were on the state board, um, took up some revisions on the social or the social studies curriculum, including revising the inclusion of history across elementary and middle schools. If you can tell us a little bit about your experience, um, you know, developing that curriculum and what kind of process that you all went through. And then also just um, speak to how important this role is, obviously with curriculum, and then also how you've been able to work with the other members of the state board, especially you know, knowing that they're in those three different, um, those three different categories that they focus on. So let's start at the beginning. Yes. <laughs> yes, the State Board of Education is responsible for um, approving curriculum. However, Senate Bill 6, um, about 12 years ago, um, changed the overall authority of what the State Board actually has. And so pri prior to that, previously, um, school boards were only allowed to adopt curriculum that was on the State Board approved list. Since that time, that bill uh, was passed and allowed local school boards to be the ultimate authority of what's adopted as curriculum in their school districts. So know who it is that you're, mm -hmm. you're that you're, you're voting in on your school boards because that is ultimately who is responsible for the curriculum. Um, since that time, the state board that publishers do submit their their um, textbooks and their IMs, their instructional materials, to the state board for approval because what they're looking for um, is the gold star, is the thumbs up, is the as Texas goes, so goes the rest of the nation um, element in it, and it really gives that publisher. The, the push that they need and the, the pride that they need to um, source those materials to other states as well. Um, but the state boards um, it is not the end all be all for school districts. They can choose to, to pick their curriculum from anywhere that they choose to to, um, to get it. So it does not have to be on our list. Uh, when I was running for state board at that time, um, health and sex education, uh, that those teaks were being um, revised. And Barbara Cargo was in my seat and I hugged her up and I said, thank you for doing that because that was hugely <laughs> controversial. And she said, oh girl, <laughs> you have social studies. And I thought, <laughs> oh, it can't be that bad. I, well, I was mistaken. Um, in that time, of course, even though those TEKS were adopted, revised for health and sex ed, we, I have been on the board since we've adopted the curriculum for that. And at the time, um, when there were four publishers that submitted curriculum to be reviewed for health and sex education, and only one publisher actually ended up with that thumbs up from mm -hmm. the state board. Um, I have worked with that publisher. I was the only um, member that voted against all of the curriculums, because in those areas I did feel like that is local control. What's 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 um, appropriate in Apple Springs might not necessarily be 
uh, appropriate in Austin. It might not meet the community standards. It, it might, it's drastically different in different areas. And so um, with Senate Bill 6, I felt like that that's a good place for the local school boards to adopt curriculums um, that impact their students in that very personal way. Um, I had, did work with the publisher that did come through and uh, let them know um, the, the elements within the book that was adopted that I felt needed to be very Texas specific. Um, they, although they put Texas on the front of the book, um, it was aligned to a lot of national standards. It did have all of the teaks in it. It's, um, I would say 90% aligned in the first 19 chapters. Um, you have to purchase the chapters 20 and 21 in order to be 100% aligned for all of the teaks. That's a supplemental piece to it. However, um, there were elements in there that said Texas law says that you have to, whatever it is, but they didn't list the Texas law. Um, they failed to list parental opt-in for different elements and, and also just some real specific things that we do here in Texas to protect parental rights. And so um, they, they heard what I said. We sent many emails back and forth um, and they submitted my request of edits um, and which the Committee on a Curriculum approved 32 pages of edits to, to that book. Wow. Um, we have had, that is the one book for the State Board of Education on that list, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's gonna be out there and it's gonna have my name on it, I wanna make sure that it's the best mm -hmm. thing that we can put in students' hands. Um, that's how I spent my summer, in case anybody <laughs> was wondering. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and just so people know, I like your local school board who are elected, that, that is a nonpartisan race, they do that for free. State Board is also an unpaid position. We do what we do at no cost to the state. Um, we, we don't get paid um, at all. Uh, we volunteer uh, to do what we do mm -hmm. and, uh, and I love every minute of it or I wouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, moving forward, um, social studies of course was up, was the next up and um, we, what I found out was um, the previous board had approved to move social studies forward in their, their revision. Mm -hmm. Technically, social studies, we weren't even supposed to look at social studies till next year, like 2023. Mm. Um, but for some reason, the, the previous board decided, no, we're going to speed this process up and we're going to look at it a little, little sooner. Well, that blew up. So we, um, the legisl last legislature, 87th legislation, wrote legislation and asked us to ensure that we have alignment with civics education. Make sure that within those social studies teaks, there there are civics in there. And so... That was really the only immediate thing that the State Board of Education was charged with. And I can tell you that we will have that completed by December, by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we'll finish it most likely in November at our next meeting coming up in a few weeks um, from now. In that time, this, the commissioner proposed to us a particular framework that had been of interest to him. And when we looked at it initially, we thought, oh, this is not a bad idea. Let's take a look at it. Um, but it went sideways real quick, um, as everybody knows. And so um, we, we pulled back and said, hey, let's take a deep breath. Let's, let's look at this real quick. Let's hear um, what the, the complaints are. Let's hear what the, the pros and cons are. Um, and how much of these teaks actually need to be updated? Like how much of it, there are current events that do, but do we really need to change? history right. like mm -hmm. it is what it is and so um and so the board um has set it aside um it's not it's percolating mm -hmm. like a pot of coffee mm -hmm. um it's not that they're that we're not still looking at some things we are discovering we're looking for new frameworks we're talking about how many years of texas history should be taught how many years of you know world cultures uh, geography all of those things um and in what grades they should be taught and should it be changed. And so um, I'm very fortunate um, to have had one constituent that was on one of the work groups. And we sit on opposite sides of our thinking on, mm -hmm. on this. Um, however, we've been engaged in a phenomenal conversation um, going back and forth and back and forth, teaching each other what it is um, that that she needs to, that she needs to know and that I need to know in order to really make the best choices for our children here in Texas. So I look forward to the work that we're going to get done. Next is math. I'm really hoping it's not as controversial, but <laughs> somebody told me it was. So who knows if y'all see me crying. <laughs> 
absolutely understand. <laughs> Who likes algebra that much? You know? So we'll see. That's great. Well, um, next we're going to go into um, some conversations about our local elections, some um, deadlines and uh, information about the League of Women Voters. So I want to thank you so much for your time here tonight. Is there anything, um, you know, before we transition over to um, League of Women Voters business that you'd like to, um, to say? Sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to encourage everyone uh, to begin voting. It starts October 24th. Make sure you know where your polling location is. Sometimes they're not all open during early voting, so make sure you know where you go and you vote all the way to the end of the ballot. A lot of the local school board races are at the very bottom. It's my understanding here in Harris County. Um, it's uh, eight, nine, ten pages long. It's really, really long. Uh, fortunately, like in Trinity County, it's like two pages. So <laughs> um, uh, take your time. It's not a one-punch vote. It's not a one-party vote. Vote for the best person in the seat. Um, and just make sure that you, you have your voice heard. Vote all the way. Vote all the way to the end. Don't skip over anyone. So thank you very much. Well, Dr. Young, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure interviewing you and uh, good luck in your race. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, to transition to my favorite subject is elections and voting. So as everyone knows, um, general voting is November 8th on Tuesday. Early voting starts from October and runs to November 4th. Um, Mail-in ballot applications are due October 28th. And uh, for mail-in application ballots, there are several rules you have to follow, so make sure you pay attention to um, all of those rules. Uh, check in with the votetexas.gov website with the Secretary of State. You can also call 1-800-252-VOTE or 8683 to access additional information on mail-in ballots. Great. Um, the next thing I also want to mention um, that Dr. Young alluded to is making sure that you have um, educated nonpartisan information for your um, to select the candidates in the for the election. You can the. English and Spanish, Vietnamese and Chinese versions of the League of Women Voters Voters Guide is available. We have print versions thanks to Houston Chronicle and then we also have online versions that you can find at lwvhouston.org. You can also go to vote411.org. You can type in your, e your, um, your physical address and it will populate your actual ballot and you can go through and choose candidates um, based on the answers that they provided. These questions are completely um, nonpartisan and unedited. We reach out to all candidates on the ballot and ask them questions relevant to the races that they're running and then we submit that information all in a very easy to read form so then that way you can choose um, which candidates um, you prefer and then cast your ballot very efficiently and, um, and then you can know that you're you can print out that ballot and take it to you at these polling locations um, again we absolutely encourage early voting the voting process um, might be longer this time around because of the extra step to submit your physical paper um, of your of your voting and so please remember to um, allow extra time and early voting is highly encouraged as well and um, to wrap up for tonight um, on for our segment here, um, we want to thank you for the League of Women Voters of Houston. Um, my name is Katie Campbell Shumway. And I'm Katherine Summerlin. Thank you. And thank you for watching Can Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. Next, we have a pre-recorded conversation with Commissioner Adrienne Garcia of Precinct 2. And so we will be um, transferring over to that um, recording shortly. Tonight we have Adrian Garcia with us and uh, thank you very much for joining us. First of all, I want to do uh, let you do is tell us a little bit about yourself and who you are for those voters who may not know. Thank you uh, and good evening to everyone. I'm Adrian Garcia, County Commissioner of Precinct 2. I'm a lifelong resident <clears throat> of uh, the precinct. 
uh, born and raised in uh, Houston, Texas. My family immigrated to Houston in 1959 uh, from Mexico City. And then I was uh, born in the precinct and have lived here my entire life, raised my family here uh, and continue to be a member of the near north side. But I've been able to represent uh, the precinct in some form or fashion throughout my public service career as a Houston police officer for 23 years, as the director of the city's uh, anti-gang office, um, as a member of Houston City Council of District H, and then as the sheriff of the entire county. Uh, so I have definitely represented precinct two in some former capacity and served them in that uh, in the same way. But I am uh, a servant. Uh, leader at heart. I care about fixing things, about making sure that government works and works well for all people. And my philosophy in the office is, uh, well, actually, I got two philosophies. One is uh, uh, doing uh, what matters most to most. And, uh, and then the second one is WAI. Uh, what that means is that, you know, the, in government and for uh, issues facing communities, uh, there's not simple solutions for everything. So I encourage my staff to be innovative. So WAI stands for Wild Blank Ideas. Uh, that's how we get things done. But uh, at, at, the, uh, at the core, uh, I care about people. I care about the community. I care about the issues that we're all facing. And I just love to try to fix them. Uh, so that's why uh, when you uh, see me on TV, I talk about being the son of an auto mechanic. Uh, because my daddy did teach me how to fix things. Why is Harris County Commissioner's Court important to you, and what made you decide to initially seek a seat as a commissioner? Well, Harris County is an incredible geography. It's uh, it's a it's a part of an incredibly important state in our union, and uh, we have uh, the spaceport. We have incredible diversity uh, in Harris County. Uh, we have NASA, uh, we have the petrochem uh, industry and capital of the state, if not uh, the nation in the world. And so all those things uh, matter to me. Uh, but what also matters to me is the people who live here. Uh, I represent the most underserved area of Harris County. When I asked for permission to serve in this role, I talked about five things that I uh, felt passionate about and still do. Uh, we have the lowest medium income in all of Harris County and Precinct 2. We have the lowest home ownership rate in all of Harris County. We have the lowest educational attainment rate in all of Harris County at the high school and post high school level. We have the highest number of children and families uh, without health insurance. And then we have amongst the highest health disparities in all of Harris County. And if all those weren't bad enough, the sixth one uh, since uh, I've been here, I've learned, is the fact that we live 20 years less longer in Precinct 2 than any other part of the county. So those things are, are what I wake up thinking about. It's what I go to bed thinking about and what disrupts my sleep when I'm trying to sleep. Uh, and so as I think about infrastructure, uh, building important uh, roadways, uh, saving uh, a Beltway A bridge that was on track to be a killer bridge. Uh, I also care about the human infrastructure, uh, making sure that people in the precinct have access to quality health care, making sure that we're doing all that we can to remove the stigma of mental health, making sure that children and adults uh, of any ability, but especially those with disabilities, have an uh, inclusive park. Uh, that's unique in all of Harris County and working to create better paying jobs so that people can have greater opportunities uh, in their future. So all of those things are important to me and there is much, much more that I am passionate about. And that's why Harris County is important to me. That's why I, uh, I just uh, you know, love the opportunity to serve the people of Precinct 2 and to work on the issues uh, that are before many families. Well, you kind of anticipated my next question, and, and what I wanted to ask you is, as a result of the 2020 federal census, the map of the Harris County Commissioner's precincts uh, was redrawn last year. And so uh, you outlined some of the issues facing the district. Uh, what do you think, well, maybe describe what the district looks like today, and, and you kind of did that already, but 
what are some of its most pressing needs and concerns and maybe which ones uh, of that list that you provided, which ones do you think uh, you might want to work on first or what need to be addressed uh, more immediately? Well, Precinct 2 now, as a result of redistricting, has a uh, defined 1,300,000 residents in the precinct. Um, my, uh, the demographics are primarily 62% uh, Hispanic or Latino uh, families that live in the precinct. Um, the, uh, I, the boundaries go from uh, the, the Aldine area. I used to only represent East Aldine. Now I represent the entire Aldine area. And then I go uh, into uh, the uh, city of Houston. Uh, I cover uh, small portions of the Heights. I go into the near north side. Uh, then I go into the traditional east end of Houston, uh, east end, second ward, uh, Magnolia. Then I cover uh, the cities of, of uh, Jacinto City, Galena Park, Deer Park, Pasadena, South Houston, uh, Baytown, Shore Acres, El Lago, Taylor Lake Village, Seabrook, Webster, Nassau Bay, uh, in uh, the city of Houston. Then I come back up. I now uh, take in Friendswood and portions of Pearland. And uh, then I now uh, represent the Hobby Airport area and then come right back into the city of Houston. So those are the new boundaries. Uh, and you know, the issues that, uh, you know, what, I, what I've tried to find, and, and as I mentioned earlier, it's what matters most to most. Uh, so taking some experience uh, from my city council days, I worked to implement a uh, community plan for Precinct 2 uh, because the unincorporated areas that I serve are is where I'm the primary service deliverer. And, uh, and then I've created a partnership project so that for the cities that I mentioned, I can work collaboratively with them and invest resources into the cities because every resident, no matter what city in Harris County you may live in, you pay county taxes. And so I want to make sure that we're providing a strategic way to bring those uh, county uh, dollars into their respective uh, communities as well. So, uh, you know, and, uh, the issues uh, are that, that most care about, it's public safety, it is infrastructure, it is uh, flood mitigation, uh, it is, um, you know, uh, bringing the, uh, you know, better paying jobs, affordable housing into the area. So those are the things that I try to focus on on any given day for the entire precinct. Well, talking about flood control and <clears throat> flood control <clears throat> has become more and more of an issue uh, in Harris County. I, I guess it always was. But recently, public health uh, over the past couple of years have had a tremendous impact on Harris County. Now, how will you, as commissioner for Precinct 2, work with the county judge and the other three commissioners to address these issues that people have been concerned with recently? The traditional role of a commissioner is roads, ditches, and bridges. But because of all the things that I've laid out, I have self-defined uh, the structure of my office to include a policy uh, advisor on education, on the on environmental issues, on healthcare, and public safety, uh, on economic development, uh, because there's just so much in front of us. And so, but public health uh, or, or healthcare rather uh, has been very important to me. I tell people I am a public healthcare baby. I got my shots through. Uh, the city of Houston's uh, health clinic or Casa de Amigos back in the day. Um, and so I know the value of that. And then I, and obviously this pandemic has taught us uh, the value of a uh, well invested in public health care system. But it also, the pandemic also taught us just how vulnerable um, our community was. Uh, and, you know, it's not lost on me that Hispanics were amongst the highest uh, who died from um, COVID-19. And so uh, it just reinvigorated the fact that uh, in 2019, before the pandemic, I was uh, visiting with Baylor College of Medicine and I was chewing on them because 
the Texas Medical Center, the world-renowned medical center, matters nothing to the people of Precinct 2. They can't afford it, and they don't have the transportation to get there. So I have been pushing on the medical center to extend their footprint to East Harris County. They chase the rooftops in North and West Harris County, but there are not many rooftops in East Harris County. Uh, but they have to do the right thing. They're a member of our community. They benefit uh, from uh, all things that happen in, uh, in Harris County. And they ought to be working to serve the citizens of Precinct 2. That's why I'm proud that today, in 2019, when I was visiting with them, they shared with me some technology. Uh, and we now have access to health smart pods, technology that can be um, uh, portable, <clears throat> but it gives people the real sense that they're in a doctor's office. And now Baylor College of Medicine is a partner with me. Uh, and so we are providing those care, uh, healthcare access uh, or, or healthcare access to their programs in the Aldine area, uh, which is amongst one of the highest health disparity uh, communities. But we're also now working with the Harris Center to extend access to mental health care. And so I look at health care holistically, recognizing that uh, health care is health care, whether it's mental health care or uh, standard health care. So these are the things that I'm working on. I'm in conversations with MD Anderson. Uh, they provide resources and support for us at LBJ Public Hospital. But I shouldn't, it, it, LBJ shouldn't be, uh, or the hospital shouldn't be where people have access. There ought to be capacity in the communities uh, where the people need it the most. So, and now everyone, I, I, I'm sorry to go on, Doc, but I, I'm, I just, I'm just so passionate about this. Uh, now, in most of my facilities where I serve uh, a, a large number of senior residents, uh, they now have uh, access to health uh, smart kiosks where they can take control of their health uh, 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 indexes. <clears throat> and uh, it's private. But when I came into this office, one of the things that I was trying to get done was uh, telemedicine capacity so that uh, transportation, so I could eliminate transportation and access all in one, uh, uh, in one, in one blow. Uh, the rules prior to the pandemic were different, but now we're, uh, we've just got our private booths so that we can start to do telemedicine in our facilities. They just arrived a couple of weeks ago. So um, again, I don't take all the various things that challenge our community lightly. Uh, I'm very fortunate, if not by the grace of God, there go I. So I, uh, you know, my dad uh, told me when I started in my public service career, never forget where you come from. And so I know what hunger is about. I know what poverty is about. And, uh, and I want to make sure that we're not ignoring that for others in the community. So I'm, I, these are the things that I'm passionate about, as you can well tell. But healthcare is at the top of the list. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of things at the top of the list, but healthcare is one of those. Let me ask you a, a question that's kind of right up your alley, because considering your past experience, uh, a lot of people are concerned about crime in Harris County. And, and, Statistics show us that crime is increasing across the country, and Harris County is no different. And in Houston, we're about in the middle of the nation's largest cities. Murders are going up a little bit, and in in the county, stats are kind of remaining flat. So, as county commissioner and kind of responsible for a wide variety, and and you described the the large section of the county that that. You, you'll be commissioner for if you win the election. How do you see yourself and, and how can you help to confront the issues, uh, you and county commissioner's court and the county judge, uh, the, these crime issues that people seem to be so concerned about with right now? Well, look, the first thing is I, I tell people I'm more of a cop than I am a commissioner. I've been a cop for uh, the greater part of my life, 23 years with the Houston Police Department, uh, even when I served on Houston City Council, I was the chair of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee, working very closely with the Houston Police Department, uh, the police chief, and uh, and then uh, as sheriff for the entire county. So 
public safety is always top of mind for me. It is why uh, prior to the pandemic, I worked to implement Shot Spotter. I'm the only commissioner who's taken out of his uh, own budget to invest into it. Shot Spotter is a, uh, a audio triangulation uh, technology that allows gunshots to be detected and reported directly to law enforcement versus waiting for a human being in the community to let us know what they thought they heard. Uh, and we've had immense success with it. And uh, I'm also the commissioner who, when I started to hear about the backlog uh, in the courts and, uh, and whether there was uh, uh, low bail being provided to uh, violent offenders and whether uh, cases were moving or not or dockets were moving or not, I'm the one that constructed transparency to measure um, what the performance of our uh, courts are in terms of moving their dockets. I'm the, the one that helped to construct millions of dollars of investment into our backlog uh, challenges, uh, funding the district attorney's office, funding the courts, helping to create a new district court, helping to bring associate judges into the framework. And then I'm also the commissioner who uh, pushed for uh, a, a $3 million investment into uh, uh, hot spots in the uh, Harris County area. The sheriff has had immense success with it, arresting hundreds of people, uh, committing violent crimes, arresting uh, hundreds of wanted individuals uh, who are wanted for violent crimes. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and then I'm also the commissioner who helped to construct the Violent Persons Task Force that brings constables and the sheriff uh, together to go out and, and be able to, to immediately go out and arrest individuals uh, that, are, uh, that have outstanding warrants for violent crimes in their community. So public safety is always top of mind for me. But I'll tell you this, uh, Dr. Chris, that uh, the investments that we've been making uh, throughout these years, recognizing the national crime wave that was consuming so many areas like Harris County, we did not uh, sit still. Uh, the investments that I have mentioned, uh, over 130 new, uh, million new dollars into public safety as a whole, into the criminal justice system, the district attorney, the courts, and the cops, uh, has netted us these results thus far this year. Homicide is down uh, by nearly uh, 32%. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, homicide is down nearly 12%. Um, sexual assault is uh, down nearly 32%. And then aggravated assault and aggravated robbery is down nearly 10% this year. So we're moving in the right direction. We're going to stay, uh, we're going to keep our foot on the accelerator, uh, but the people's safety is never, never lost on me, and I pay attention to it on a regular basis. I work very closely with our sheriff uh, to implement the strategies necessary to keep us safer. Adrian Garcia, I want to thank you so much for spending time uh, <clears throat> with us today, and uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulties at first getting started, but you came through and technology came through. And uh, thank you for, for sharing those answers with the League of Women Voters and uh, best wishes on the campaign. Thank you so much. And thank you to the League of Women Voters. Really appreciate you helping us uh, to protect our democracy. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gene Preuss. Uh, thank you for joining us on Conversations with the Candidates here at Houston Media Source TV. Uh, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to remind everybody that this is something we do every election cycle is we invite candidates to come on the show and give us their side of the story, to give us their background, give us information on the, the important issues they think. Now, maybe many of you are familiar with the League of Women Voters Voters Guide. We put those out every year. Uh, the Voters Guide, in fact, went out just a, a few a week, a week ago. And in that, we send uh, every candidate on the ballot across Harris County uh, several questions to address, and they can uh, address them as they wish. Now, not everybody participates in that, unfortunately, 
But it's important for you as voters and uh, the general public to be able to look and to see where those candidates stand. Now, a lot of times they're putting a lot of money into ads, and it, but we provide this as a free service. Uh, we're a nonpartisan organization, so uh, we're happy to have Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Green Party candidates. Uh, as long as you've registered and uh, we know that uh, you're going to be on the ballot, we'll try to reach out and contact you. Now, coming on the show is a little bit different because uh, you know we have certain times that we can schedule the studio, so not everybody can come out, but we do reach out to other candidates. So I want to thank the candidates that appeared on the show tonight, and that's Adrian Garcia, who we saw on video. He couldn't be here in person, so he did a taped interview, and also Audrey Young, who is running for State Board of Education. And uh, she was able to come out. Now, sometimes we reach out to candidates, and we did reach out to other candidates as well, and uh, they uh, weren't able to uh, accept the offer. And so we wish all candidates, uh, everybody who runs, best wishes, and uh, we support your efforts. And thank you for stepping up and standing up for election so that the voters can choose and helping us to help educate the voters. The, as I said earlier, the voter's guide is available online and you can find information about that uh, through our, our Facebook site, uh, lwvhouston.org. You can also go to 411, that's on the internet, four one, vote411.org, vote411.org, and that is uh, that will give you information from across the state and even across the nation about voting. That is the League of Women Voters uh, website on uh, uh, run website. You can also find information about what we do here in Houston. Information about joining the League of Women Voters uh, at LW, LVW Houston. Uh, that's on Facebook and on Twitter. Those are our social media outlets. LWV Houston. Uh, and either one of those uh, will get you uh, to our social media account. And you go to our Facebook, you get links to our website. So let me remind everybody here of a few things coming up, just some internal housekeeping. We do have election uh, candidates, a conversation with the candidates about the general election coming up. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what's coming up next, on Thursday, October 27th, Again, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. we'll be on. And we're going to have, uh, we've offered uh, two races again. And that is going to be Harris County Commissioner Precinct 4. Candidates from that race, uh, we've offered them a spot. And we do have some of the candidates have accepted already. Uh, and then we're also going to uh, invite uh, a brand new district uh, as a part of redistricting that we were talking about earlier in the show. We have a U.S. House of Representatives, a new seat in Houston, a new seat in Texas, and that is seat 38, U.S. House of Representatives, District 38. And we do have uh, three candidates that we reached out to, Duncan Klausman, Joel DeGene, and Wesley Hunt are running for that seat, and we've reached out to their campaigns uh, and invited them to come on the show. That's next week. On November the 3rd, we have set aside time for the Harris County Judges race. Um, and there are three candidates running for that, Alexandra Del Moral Miller, Lena Hidalgo, and uh, Noful uh, Hujami. Uh, and we've invited them to come on the show as well. And we've set aside time for them to answer questions about that important race. So we hope that our candidates will be able, and sometimes, you know, because it's live TV and we have certain times, uh, other issues come up, uh, certainly traffic issues come up. Right now we're uh, rooting for our hometown team, the Astros, but uh, traffic was pretty thick coming into Houston, and, and sometimes uh, traffic does affect uh, people coming onto the show uh, or other events happen. So, uh, we again, we do wish all candidates well and running for their election. The general election is coming up on November the 8th. And I want to read some important dates to you if you're uh, planning on voting this time around. Again, the general election is November 8th. Everybody's familiar with that. But we do have some other dates, and you can see uh, from the graphic on the screen. The deadline to register, uh, whether in person or uh, 
by mail was Tuesday, October the 11th. But early voting will begin here in Harris, Travis County, well, across the state, on October the 24th. That's 17 days before the election. And you may vote at any voting location in your county. And uh, a weekend voting may be available at certain places. So check on that. Check to find out where your local, your closest voting place is. That's October 24th through November the 4th. Then we'll have um, mail-in ballot uh, applications, though the deadline to register for that is October the 28th. Now, you have to meet some criteria if you're planning on voting absentee um, or, or mail-in. Um, the last day to request a ballot is 11 days before the election. That's, that's law. You can return your absentee ballot request through the mail or in person. And there was uh, some talk on the news today about the cost. It's going to cost, I think, three stamps to return those. Uh, and, but you can also return those in mail. Uh, the ballots must be received by 7 p.m. on Election Day in order to be counted. And your local election office has more information. So if you want to vote absentee, you have to have several criteria to meet. Absent from your county of residence on Election Day and during the early voting period. Uh, sick or have disabilities that prevent you from voting in person without assistance. 65 years of age or older. Uh, expecting to give birth within three weeks before or after the election day. If you're confined to jail, serving a misdemeanor sentence, or confined to jail without bail, pending trial for a felony or appeal of a felony conviction, uh, or are civilly committed under Chapter 84 of the Texas Health and Safety Code. So those are some of the criteria. Those are the criteria you need to meet for mail-in ballot. Now remember, to vote in Texas, you do need a valid photo ID. And let's talk a little bit about those. And you can see the graphic on the screen there, a Texas driver's license. Now, if you are have an expired license, it has to be within four years of the expiration date. But if you're age 70 or over, there is no expiration deadline but in both cases, the information on your voter ID, on your identification must still be accurate, must be correct. You need to have, for a photo ID, another option is a Texas Election Identification Certificate or a Texas Personal Identification Card, a Texas Handgun License. All of those are issued by the Department of Public Safety. You may also have with you a United States military ID card, as long as it has your photograph, United States citizenship certificate containing your photograph, or a United States passport, either the book or the card. And so long as they have your photograph, again, that is what you need. Now, there are some... Um, some other things that if you don't have a photo ID that you can do, and more information is available at Vote411 and also at the League of Women Voters site. So if you have other things that you're worried about or other um, problems, uh, you still may be able to vote. You just need to check and make sure that uh, you're following uh, the rules and regulations. And providing you can you can bring additional supporting documents that may help you as well. So those are some of the things. Once again, I do want to remind you that if you go to League of Women Voters Houston, LWVHouston.org, you can find a lot more information, and you can also find uh, our famous voters guides. Those are available where a lot of candidates have answered questions that you can read to inform yourself. One of the things about voting in the United States is we expect an elected voting, voting population, uh, elected, uh, uh, educated citizens. Uh, we see a lot of names on the ballot. We may not know who those people are. The Voter's Guide is one way of finding out more information about who the candidates are and where they stand on the various issues. Sometimes they have uh, party affiliation may tell you something, but a lot of times it's good to read what the candidate says for themselves when questions are posed to them. And that's something that we 
uh, and enjoy in the United States and in Texas. We have very good candidates who really care about uh, the positions they're seeking. Uh, and uh, regardless uh, of who they are, you can read what they believe in and how, how they'll stand and what they, what they stand for and how they may vote on issues that affect us all. And I think uh, Audrey Young earlier had a very good uh, warning for us all is that we need to make sure of who we're voting even at the local state boards because sometimes they make decisions that will affect you locally. So voting is important. It's a right and a responsibility of citizenship. And here at the League of Women Voters of Houston and the League of Women Voters across the state and the nation, we're concerned about educating so that when you go to the polls, you'll know who you're voting for and can make responsible, educated decisions on voting. And we want to thank you for the time that you spend with us. Thank you for tuning in to Houston Media Source. And I want to thank our two guest hosts today uh, who were interviewing Audrey Young, uh, uh, Catherine uh, Campbell, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, Catherine Summerlin, too. Katie, Katie K Catherine Shumway and Catherine Summerlin. Uh, we have two Katies that were working with us today. I want to thank both of them. Uh, they uh, did a great job, and thanks to our two candidates who appeared on the show tonight. For the League of Women Voters of Houston, I'm Gene Preuss. Have a good night, and we'll see you next week.